Hello and welcome to Gub Farm. I've had a bit of time to think over recent weeks, having hurt my shoulder. So give me time to reflect on what it is I'm trying to achieve, where I've got to and where I want to go to next. The overarching vision for Gub Farm is to produce food that has a high nutritional density. In America, the USDA have been tracking the nutritional density of food from the 1940s. And across the board, we are seeing a significant drop in minerals such as copper, magnesium, iron, zinc. We're seeing a significant drop in these minerals in various food produce. And then on the flip side, we are seeing a rise in, in related ailments. So we see asthma, bronchitis, heart ailments, and they're all connected to a reduction in the nutritional density of food. So what I want to do is, for my own family and for those that consume the food produced on Gob Farm, I want to produce a nutritionally dense food. Because we've fallen into this trap of producing more. So we're getting lots of calories from food. To look at wheat, wheat has gone from about two to three tons per hectare. And it's now pushing towards 10 ton per hectare of yields. So we're getting lots of calories, but you're actually getting less nutrients per volume of calories that you intake. So, you know, if you've ever had that craving for something, it's your body telling you that you need a mineral or some sort of a nutrient and you eat. So we're consuming lots of calories to try and get the basic minerals that our bodies need. And I believe that's one of the reasons why we have issues with obesity in society today. There are multiple viewpoints on what is causing the reduction in nutritional density in food. So there's one line of thought that blames the increase in the carbon dioxide in the air. And they can point to studies that show if you increase the carbon dioxide in the air, then the mineral yield or the nutritional um, mineral yield from the plants declines. There is another line of thought that we have bred plants purely for calorific output. So we've got plants to go from two to three tons per hectare to 10 tons per hectare. And the consequence of that is that we have lost key traits in those plants. So we've got loads of calories, but very low minerals. And it's not just wheat. We see the same in, for example, broccoli. Broccoli has seen a significant decline in the amount of calcium in the plant. So, you know, we may have to go back and look at older varieties of produce to try and get back to that nutritional density that we once expected from food. Another viewpoint is that the decline in nutritional density is down to farming practices. It's down to hammering the ground with nitrogen to try and stimulate growth and cutting out and suppressing killing the fungi in the ground. So in the normal order of things a plant takes in carbon and sunlight and rain and it creates an exudate. It sends it into the roots and it signals to the fungi in the ground, the mycorrhizal, it says I need some copper, I need some zinc and the mycorrhizal in exchange for the, the exudate they bring the minerals that the plant needs and there is many many varieties of fungi in the ground and they all serve a purpose some break down gold some break down zinc etc and they feed it to the plant so what we've done is we, we've created a farming system whereby we apply nitrogen which cuts out the need for the plant to work with the mycorrhizal in the ground and the plant doesn't have the nutrients that it actually needs it's just pumped up to look good but in reality we're getting a much lower grade quality product. So my plan is to solve this problem in two ways. Firstly, I want to establish a biodiverse permaculture environment for the plants and trees that I grow. And their job is to mine and mobilize the, the minerals that are in the ground and make them available to other plants. The second thing is I'm looking at natural ways to try and get minerals into the soil. And there's some evidence to suggest that rock dust is a way forward and other people are suggesting sea salt. And I've been looking around for evidence to kind of confirm that viewpoint. And I think one of the, 
best examples that I can find on my own farm is to look at dandelions. So dandelions like mineral rich soils, partly they like compaction as well. So along the side of the lanes or along areas that have stone underneath them, I'm seeing a lot of dandelions on the farm. And that tells me that if you do put down rock dust, the plants can utilize it because otherwise, why are the dandelions growing? So I think there's some level of evidence to suggest that maybe that actually is a way forward. Put down some rock dust, it has, it's so rich in minerals and they're not soluble but over time the fungi will mine those minerals, break them down and make them available to the, uh, to the other plants. So the overarching theme of what I want to achieve then is I want to produce nutritionally dense food. I want to do it without fertilizers. I want to use natural systems to get the nutrients into the, into the plants. I do not want to use pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, things that kill things. I want to encourage the, the food web to provide the nutrients that my plants need. So one of the challenges then I have with this vision is should I become certified as organic? Because organic only means I'm not killing things, I'm not putting down the pesticides, the herbicides, etc. And I think there's a, there's a gap in, in the regulatory environment for farming around nutritional density. I think one of the big conversations that has to happen over the coming years is to establish benchmarks for what is nutritionally dense food. You know, if you're buying something, you know, we need to have a clear statement of what is its contribution towards your diet. So at the moment we have a system whereby it tells you what is the calories produced by the food, what is the percentage of protein that you get from the food that you're eating, and that's readily available on the packaging. But I think the next step in that process is the, the regulators need to start to get the producers to define what are the minerals and how they contribute towards your diet. So for example, magnesium, eat 100 grams, you're gonna get 5% of your input required there. Zinc, per 100 grams, you're gonna get 3%, whatever the numbers are. But I think we need to progress the conversation now into nutritional density and getting that on labels and educating people about the dangers of just consuming calories, empty calories, um, without getting the basic minerals that we need to function. And the benefits to society are many fold. You know, we start, we have too many people suffering from ailments that can be reversed if they had a good healthy diet. So let's take a walk around the farm and I'll show you where I've got to so far in, in, the, in the introduction of produce as I set about trying to achieve this vision. When I set about developing the strategy for Gub Farm, I kind of asked myself, what are my primary inputs? And it's really quite simple, it's the same for all farmers. It is solar energy, it is rainfall, air and soil. And so what you have to do as a farmer, you have to work out how do you maximise the conversion of these inputs into produce. In Fermanagh, we have above average rain when compared to, for example, the, the southern part of Ireland. So we average about three or over three litres per square metre per day, whereas for the south in Ireland, it's probably closer to around two, so we have 50% more rain input. Now there are pros and cons with that. On the plus side, trees grow very well around here. And indeed, when the sun is shining, you can grow just about anything. But we don't have as much sunshine as the most southern parts of Ireland. To the downside, ground is wet. So if you're running livestock, you'll do well to have the animals out seven months of the year. That means we have a very high cost, a very high wintering cost of animals. But you know, we can produce a lot of grass during that growing season, which is a plus. So when developing the the strategy for Gub Farm, I said, okay, one of, the, one of the things I have to do is to try and maximize the time outside for any livestock that I want to introduce. And there's a, 
a wonderful bit of research going on about 60 miles due east of here in Loch Gaul. And it was started by a man called Jim McAdam. And basically he planted trees, I think it was on a five by five meter grid. And they're all tall canopy trees. So his observations were over the first 12 to 15 years, no significant uh, decrease in grass um, yield. A second observation that he made was as the yield of grass declined, he didn't see a decline in uh, weight gain for livestock compared to his control. And his reasoning was the animals were able to get more shelter onto the trees and they required less energy to regulate their body temperature. A third observation was that he saw a significant increase in the amount of time that he could keep cattle outside grazing. So he saw on average he was getting 15 to 18 weeks of extra grazing time. So when I looked into this further, it became clear that there is also a fourth benefit. Rushes don't like to grow beside trees. So you can see in fields that have a heavy rush overgrowth, as you go up towards the hedgerow, the rushes decline significantly. So you have maybe six to 10 feet that have very little rushes. So I said, okay, first of all then, as I developed the, the strategy for Gub Farm, trees have to be at the center of it. But you know, I reflected on what Jim McAdam had said, and he had went for canopy trees. So the yield there is timber in the long term, but I was looking for something that was maybe more compact, that would create less light competition over time, and um, have maybe a, another way of generating revenue in the near term. So I settled on nut trees, and basically I walked the hedgerows of this farm, and everywhere I turned there were hazelnut trees. So I decided I'm going to, first and foremost, I'm going to plant hazelnut trees. So the trees are now established, they're planted, they're in the ground. So now it's time to move on to the second phase. So the second part is then to establish a biodiverse permaculture orchard. So my reason there is I want to mobilize the minerals that are in the ground to feed the trees to create nutritionally dense food. So I've now started um, on interplanting between the trees. And again, I want to produce something that will have a resale value while mobilizing these minerals. So I'm looking at a diverse mix of, of shrubs, everything from aronia, black corn, gooseberries, juneberries, etc. Just a big mix. Then I want to establish, or as part of that process, I want to get the nitrogen fixtures in the ground and I want to get the accumulators in the ground. So I'm looking at legumes, maybe shrubs like Siberian pea. Um, I'm looking at accumulators like comfrey to bring up minerals um, and mobilize minerals in the soil. So the trees will dry out the ground and hopefully provide a cash crop. The interplanting will hopefully mobilize minerals and some of that produce will hopefully also contribute towards producing a cash crop. So then the third component then is I'm looking at livestock. So I've looked at sheep, I've looked at beef, I've looked at chickens and I'm not going to be in a position to put cattle around it for many years because of the damage they'll do to the trees. And again, sheep, it's going, to have, it's going to require a lot of expense and fencing to stop them eating at the barks. So what I have settled on is chickens. So my goal over the next two years is to build that up to about two to 3,000 uh, pasture-fed chickens. So I'm going to put out little mobile units that will hold about, about 120 boards and have them distributed around the farm. And those boards will hopefully then be able to enjoy the biodiversity being established around all the trees that will attract insects and be able to nibble on the insects, nibble on the comfrey, nibble on all the various inputs that they have, again, to create this nutritionally rich food. So I have very high expectations on producing a, a very high quality, nutritionally dense, well flavored egg. And I'm really looking forward to bringing that product to the market. So this channel is taking you on that journey from planting all the way through to the production and the sale of the food. There are many challenges to overcome. You know, it's not just enough for me to be, to produce an organic output. I want to create nutritionally dense food. I want to produce food that'll keep my family and the people who consume my food healthy. So there's a lot to learn. There's gonna be many challenges to overcome. And now my cup of tea is empty, so I better get back to work. So until next time, good luck.